Summary of Dynasties Fortunes and Misfortunes of the World's Great Family Businesses By David S. Lands Why study dynasties? Today's economists generally ignore family businesses as a subject worthy of study and analysis. Popular economic thinking takes the stance that family-run businesses are not strong enough to be major economic influencers. Although significant, multi-generation dynasties merit closer examination, economists have largely ignored them. Why? The reasoning is that they are transitional entities. As businesses grow, they need specialized skills that often can be found only outside the confines of a family, particularly when technology develops beyond family members' expertise. Also, as businesses boom, Successive wealthy generations generally prefer to pursue interests outside of commerce, and leave the workings of family companies to paid managers. In the European Union, 60% to 90% of businesses are family-run, accounting for roughly two-thirds of jobs. In the 1990s, 90% of the companies in the US were family-based firms. At that time, one-third of Fortune 500 businesses were either family-controlled or could trace their roots back to family enterprise. Further study reveals that family businesses generally outperform non-family businesses. Family dynasties offer both relevant lessons and compelling stories. Family-based entrepreneurship is the best hope of the developing world and the individual, ambitious entrepreneur. Yet historically, even in families where the first and second generations increase and preserve the business, most subsequent generations focus e with more or less success on husbanding the fortunes, not on running the companies that generated the wealth. The sagas of those families have great individual distinctions and humbling similarities. The business of banking, the bearings. In the 17th and 18th centuries, most bankers started as successful merchants who had the wherewithal to lend money to others at a profit and became merchant bankers. Members of the ruling class often sought their services, yet these powerful connections also often spelled the banker's downfall. No one could refuse to lend money to royalty, but enforcing repayment was often impossible. Savvy merchant bankers used their royal connections to make money elsewhere. Others went bust. At a time when the upper classes looked down on people in business or industry, banking was a more socially acceptable profession. Successful bankers could eventually enter the lofty world where they lent money, sending their children to private schools, making advantageous marriages and buying land. The rise and fall of Britain's bearing family dynasty contradicted one well-known pattern. Usually, subsequent generations inherit a founder's money, and not the pioneer's energy and entrepreneurship but the Bearings had more hard-working generations than most family dynasties. Bearing Bank was a groundbreaking enterprise. It traded in commodities and made loans. The family rose to prominence with the bank and maintained that position for several generations. However, since their successors had the wealth and power to pursue outside interests, the family business faded away. Johann Bering began his family dynasty in the early 1700s. He traded in wool so successfully that he was able to marry a woman with a large dowry. He increased her fortunes, and when he died in 1748, he left his wife and three sons quite wealthy. His widow managed his businesses well, and increased the family wealth to some £70,000 by the time she died in 1766. Francis was the most successful of Johann's sons. He began as a merchant and trader but soon concentrated more on facilitating trade by lending and moving commercial paper. He prospered, and purchased art and land. When he died in 1810, he was known as, the first merchant in Europe. During the French Revolution, the Bearings lent funds to the British government. After the war, France needed reparations money to compensate its enemies and victims for wartime damages. The Bearings authored this complex financial transaction, ultimately making 720,000 British pounds, $150 million today. But, being virulent anti-Semites, the Bearings purposely excluded the Rothschilds, prominent Jewish bankers, from these transactions. Ironically, it was the Rothschilds, working with the Bank of England and acting primarily for the good of the country and the banking business, who saved Bearings Bank from bankruptcy when Cyan Edward Bearing, the stuffy, ostentatious Baron Revelstoke, lost huge sums of money lending to Argentina. 
After World War II, the Bearings Group split into many different companies. Family members retained executive positions, but relied more heavily on outside managers, particularly bank chairman Andrew Tucky. Disaster struck the company in 1995. A rogue trader named Nick Leeson speculated greedily and unethically. When his improprieties were brought to light, the Bearing Bank was once again on the verge of bankruptcy. This time, no one could bail it out. The Rothschilds The roots of the Rothschild dynasty grew in the soil of the Jewish ghetto in Frankfurt on Main, Germany. In 1757, Meyer Amschkel Rothschild started as an apprentice in court banking and trading rare coins. Over time, he became the financier for minor royals, such as the Crown Prince of Hesse. He also traded in fabric, yarn, spices, coffee and chocolate. His children joined the business as soon as they were old enough. Meyer's son, Nathan Meyer Rothschild, emigrated to England, where he made a fortune in cotton. Having family houses and connections with Jewish businesses in England and Germany gave the Rothschilds an advantage. The family began to concentrate on banking. Nathan's biggest achievement was financing Wellington's campaign against Napoleon. Other banks, such as Bearings, initially excluded the Rothschilds from post-war lending, but this was only a temporary setback as their loans were welcomed, even at high interest rates, in the next waves of financing. When Meyer died in 1812, he left clear rules for his family. Only direct male descendants were allowed in the business, no sons-in-law, and they had to marry Jewish women. Following generations strictly adhered to the rules, but Meyer's dictates began to lose power by the early 1900s. The family's banks in England, France and Germany remained strong, but failed to expand into the US. In 1848, banking's Pyre brothers threatened the Rothschild empire, but the family formed its own joint start banking venture, and the Pereres bank eventually failed. In 1905, the Rothschilds decided not to renew the traditional family partnership agreement, though the bank's branches continue in London and Paris. The family's wealth allowed subsequent generations to devote themselves to art, Jewish emancipation and other causes. Money and Manufacturing the Morgans. The Morgans differed from other family dynasties in that they were comfortable taking on partners from outside the family. The founding father was Joseph Morgan, a hotel operator in Hartford, Connecticut. After working with a local trading firm, his son, Junius, moved to Boston to pursue better opportunities. He joined a Boston partnership from 1847 to 1854, and then moved to London to join merchant banker George Peabody. In 1864, Peabody retired and his company became J.S. Morgan and Company. In 1873, Junius impressed the world of international finance with a liberation loan to France that brought in an astounding £1.5 million, or $450 million today. Junius sent his son, John Pierpont, J.P., to the finest schools in France and Germany, where the boy developed a keen head for business. He also was physically imposing, demanding, and a ladies' man, despite his gruff persona and take-it-or-leave-it attitude. These characteristics worked to his advantage in the U.S. He had a particular instinct for new technologies and formed General Electric in 1892. He also invested in railway promotion and formed U.S. Steel in 1901. Over time, Morgan's interests gained too much dominance. By 1913, the U.S. government felt that his powerful company threatened honest competition. J.P. died that year, shortly after congressional hearings. His son Jack Jr. brought in talented outside partners, such as George Perkins and Thomas W. Lamont. In the 20th century, the company split into three divisions, the London House, Morgan, Stanley and J.P. Morgan and Company. In the late 1990s, Chase purchased Morgan for a hefty $30 billion, and the Morgan name continues in that merged entity. The Rockefellers Patriarch John D. Rockefeller was born in the Midwest in 1839 and ran a mercantile partnership when he was still a teenager. His work ethic was deeply rooted in his strong Christianity and he viewed making money as a sacred calling. By 1862, business was booming for Rockefeller and his partner, Maurice Clark. When an industrial chemist named Samuel Andrews asked them to invest in industrial oil refining, they agreed. 
Eventually, Rockefeller created the Standard Oil Company. He used his power to negotiate shipping discounts with the railways until the government outlawed this monopolistic practice. Rockefeller had a vision of the burgeoning oil industry that required restraint, organization, rationality and frugality. At first, he did not recognize the importance of pipelines, but when it became apparent, he simply built his own and bought out his competitors. He convinced his partners to invest in the acquisition of oil-bearing properties. By 1898, Standard Oil controlled a third of the output of American crude oil. When John D. retired in the 1890s, he was one of the richest men in the U.S., worth more than $200 million, but his company could not evade scrutiny and criticism. Standard Oil's stubborn opposition to labor and unions, culminating in the Ludlow Massacre, drew tremendous fire. Reporter Ida M. Tarbell's muckraking articles badly tarnished the Rockefeller name and the reputation of Standard Oil, which broke up in 1911. However, over time, John's offspring distinguished themselves in business, philanthropy and government. Today, though the Rockefellers are more of a rich clan than a family business dynasty, they continue to be known for charitable leadership and public service. The Toyotas Sakichi Toyoda was the father of the Toyota automobile dynasty. Born in a poor agricultural area of Japan in 1867, Sakichi began in business by inventing a new handloom. By 1924, Toyota's spinning and weaving company was a success. Sakichi continued to develop better looms, eventually competing with English power looms. In 1929, he sold his loom patents used the money to move into auto manufacturing and founded the Toyota Motor Company. His son-in-law Risaburo, his son Kichiro and his nephew Eiji played major roles in its development. The company, which became Toyota in 1936, initially concentrated on wartime trucks for the government. The scarcity of materials led Kichiro to develop the Toyota Production System, TPS, which revolutionized lean and mean manufacturing, wasting neither time nor space. In the mid-1960s, Toyota introduced the Corolla, an immediate bestseller. The Toyota philosophy of Kaizen, or continuous improvement, set an international standard and the company continued to grow. Eiji became president in 1967 and Kichiro's son Shoichiro was named president of Toyota Motor Sales in 1981. By 2000, Toyota manufactured more than 60 million vehicles a year and it is now ranked second in the world. The Guggenheims In the early 1800s, Simon Meyer Guggenheim, his second wife, Rachel Weil, and their combined family of 12 children immigrated to the U.S. from a small Swiss village. He first succeeded by selling fabrics, clothing, and spices. However, the Guggenheim's real wealth came from the efforts of Simon's sons, particularly Maya, who put the family's money into mining. He began to invest in the Rockies and expanded to Mexico. Then the family invested in a treeless mountain on Kennecott Creek in Alaska, which became the world's richest copper mine, the Bonanza Lode. By 1912, it earned more than $3 million and, by 1918, it generated more money than Russia received for the Alaska Purchase. The Guggenheims continued to expand their mining explorations around the world, from South America to Africa. Today, the family's contribution remains visible in art museums worldwide and in the widespread philanthropic work carried out by later generations.